Yeah, I'd just married and um, so don't talk about this very often on radio, do I? Um, yeah, and just married, making one hundred and twenty dollars a week. My wife was supporting me. She worked at the Courier Mail selling ads, and and um, we just went one day. We yeah, you know, we'd had a few good cries occasionally, and just said, "We'll be right, we'll be right." And then we developed this idea to because they only gave me a fifty percent chance to live. Right, right. Well, thanks, mate. <laughs> Welcome back to another wonderful episode of Trademarts 120 Grit, the podcast for the working class. You and can't believe it. When you're talking working class, there's none better than our, as usual, very special guest. <laughs> they're, every, they're always special. The host of the Triple M Breakfast Show. What, 11 caps for the Wallabies, 65 for the Reds, and, uh, and actually a builder as well. Chippy by trade, is it? Chippy by trade. Did We've my apprenticeship the old-fashioned way. I didn't realise there was an adult, because I didn't start until I was 25, so I got paid $120 a week when I started, just being married, and uh, yeah, then became a builder nearly straight away, and uh, accidental radio host. And that is the sweet, soothing voice of Mr. Greg Martin. Mate, thank you so much for coming in. Sweet, boys. I love your work. You Thanks, know that. Mate. Yeah, it's good to get you in, finally. It's uh, it's hard to fit in all these busy schedules, but we've nabbed you at a at a golden time, and you're in the Rugby World Cup, mind you. So, oh my God, isn't that going off? Well, if I could uh, shoot anyone at the moment, it'd be some of the television match officials. Like one in particular, he probably wants to sue me after what I said about him last night. He sent four bloke. Anyway, let's not get it. <laughs> let's not get upset. Bit of controversy early, early on the oh, one twenty grid, mate. <laughs> They are tragic. The, the reason they become television match officials, they're not even good enough to be referees. But let's not let's, let's just not, yeah, let's yeah, start let's, at the start. Let's not go down 100%. that path, mate. The, today is we're, we're recording this on World Mental Health Day, the tenth of the tenth, and yep. you guys were gracious enough to have a chat to me this morning on the radio and have a quick yarn about what Trade Mud is doing. But Triple M are doing an awesome job at the moment of, uh, of 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 really promoting you know men's health and wellness in general, and it sounds like you you guys are really sharpened up when it comes to that sort of stuff so mate we used to be just rock and roll so uh now we've got a good had a good boss in the last 10 years or so and we've focused on men's health week first up and make sure we're dragging our listeners because god i'm one of them i hadn't had a colonoscopy i hadn't had a prostate care check didn't look after my skin do all that sort of thing getting blokes to actually come in and unless you it, People love free stuff. We know that by when we sent the Rock Patrol out. If you get an icy cold can of Coke and a packet of chips, they'll go. They'll travel five k's for that. <laughs> so you tell their wives or partners that you've uh, you're going to do a melanoma check on the first day of every summer. We do that now. We do um, have it, had all the doctors to do blood pressure every uh, early June each year. Blood pressure. Um, prostate, all that sort of things, and their wives send them along because they know we're hopeless, mate. We don't look after ourselves. So we've we've sort of got into that zone and actually making, of course, this year we started for the first time every Triple M around Australia and there's all the regional towns now are Triple M's as well, um, hundreds of radio stations, no talk day. So between the songs, the DJs didn't talk. So it just it meant it's your chance to have a chat. So Triple M's trying to catch up, mate, and be a modern, uh, well-meaning, thinking man's radio station. Now, in between those like in between those songs when no one was talking, if people were to tune into the radio and didn't hear it. They anything, had a lap. They had a did they, running lap over that said, this is the reason why. Okay, right. It, it was actually, it was fortuitous. It was on the week. We had, we have a week off in June. I was fishing on Morton Island, so I wasn't talking anyway. You were having <laughs> so a pretty laid back I was day. listening going, well, that sounds unreal. And it was got a great response too. So we'll be doing that every year as well. Mate, brilliant. So well, you so you mentioned the, the sorry, the, you mentioned the, the, the stuff around the melanoma stuff and obviously that's pretty close to you and you've got your own personal story about that. Should we, but should we take it back a little further and, and get a bit of a background to to, yeah. to, to, to to who you are and where you've come from. Where I came from, I went to a private boys' school, so I wasn't supposed to be a carpenter, and I got into university. You guys, <laughs> they steer you into university. So I was virtually in a, a school that was a university factory, and everyone went to university. So, of course, I went to university. I did human movements because the chicks were so hot. It was <laughs> unreal. Had no intention because my whole aim, my whole aim in life, was to play rugby for Australia by the time. I realised by when I was oh, 16, 17, that's what I wanted to do. My only aim in life was to play, had no career aims apart from to play rugby for the Wallabies before I hit 21. And I got picked, um, I was at university studying human movements and uh, not, 
I, I, I knew I was never going to use it because I didn't want to be a 42-year-old with a beer gut hanging over my tennis shorts telling kids to run around the oval. Um, I did it because I was interested and I wanted to finish something. I thought, I better finish something while Just I'm apply playing. yourself. Rugby. And it kept me out of the workforce while I trained for rugby because we were amateurs. So um, I got picked. It uh, would have been four weeks to go. 1984, okay? I'm 20 years of age, just before my 21st birthday. Par- uh, birthday. Got picked to play for the Wallabies. We were on a tour. See, if you remember your history, if you know your history of Australian rugby, 1984 was the Grand Slam tour. We won everything that year. Um, got picked to play for the Wallabies. We were leaving the next day for a two-test tour of Fiji. I was the only fullback picked. And um, we played on the Saturday, or no, on the Sunday. We were leaving the next day. Played on the Sunday against New South Wales Country ACT combined. We won the game 76 nil. In the first uh, first set piece, first scrum of the match, I came in from fullback, got hit from three different directions by guys and tore three out of the four ligaments of my knee, ACL, medial and collateral. And uh, sat in the dressing room with my dad and cried. Yeah, that was a real... I don't, I'd never talk about that because there's nothing to talk about. No one remembers that. When a guy leaves a football field and doesn't go on a Wallaby tour, they don't remember. So I should have been in the Wallabies from 1984. In those days, so there's your scar. That scar goes from there to there and the one on the outside goes from there to there. Uh, everything was done by hands and my surgeon had enormous pause on him. So it split me open. I didn't play. end up playing for the Wallabies for another three years. Wow. That's how long it took. It took a year before I could run again properly and then got back in the Queensland team and finally made the Wallabies 87. So, oh, hey, that, that made me unbelievably tough. Because you know how you hear these footy players, oh, I had six months while I got my knee better. Well, in those days, it took 12 weeks. I was in plaster from my hip to my toes for uh, three months See, these days, you're getting one of those knee braces where you slowly yeah. get better, and next thing you know, some people are playing the same season with the ACL. In those days, yeah, it took, it took a full year. So that everyone says, toughest thing is when you're away from the team doing rehab. In those days, there wasn't such professional rehab or anything. I had to do it all myself. And that's when I started riding a pushy, just trying to make my knee stronger and stronger. It took me three years to get back in the Wallabies. It was horrible. Wow. Hey, run us through your, your state, your mental state, when all that was going on. I mean, back in those days, so we were um, yeah, talking to Shiloh, Back in the day, it was just sort of coach would come in, scream and yell, and if you're injured, you're no good, so you just sort of cast to the side. Is that how it sort of felt? Well, one minute you're part of a big, happy family. You're about to be part of the Wallabies. I'd been part of the Reds for uh, since I was 19 years of age, so I'd played for – that was my second year in the Reds, and all of a sudden I'd been picked for Australia. How good do you feel? And then Top of the world. There's nothing. There was no – you just you, – you went – the Reds had a doctor, but you went to his – he was over at Milton in his own clinic. You went and consulted with him. They gave you a uh, – they paid for my operation and stuff. And then you're on your own. Mm. And there was no internet to check how do you rehab from a thing, how you rehab from a, an ACL injury, and it was early days. Yeah. Previously, that was the end. But I went, no, I'm going to make this work. And a schoolboy mate of mine who played rugby league for Valleys did his the same weekend. So he used to live over the road from me at West Chermside. Just incredibly. We were done. Our knees were done the same day. He never played again. He tried to rehab, but he tried to rehab, and then... He just drifted off into work, whereas I went, hold on, that was my dream. That was my only dream. It got taken away from me. Um, geez, it made me, it made me so tough. It made me so tough. And I, I had a girlfriend, but I, just rugby was everything to me. Footy was everything. So I did everything I could to get back, and, and finally I did. So, yeah, lost a pro- probably lost a half a metre of pace, and that, you know, that I just cope. You found other ways of coping. So yeah, well. loved it the day. Could didn't get back in. That first Rugby World Cup was 1987. Talk about the Rugby World Cup now. It started in 1987. I got picked. The Wall Blacks won that game, okay, won the World Cup. I got picked for the next test um, straight after that World Cup in uh, 1987. I stood there. I was on the bench and didn't get on the field because in those days you had to be injured and cleared by a doctor to enter the field or play in a test match. And someone said, gee, you must have been disappointed. I looked across at those frigging All Blacks doing the harker that day and went, I was actually fearful. I'm, I'm glad I, somebody said, oh, I bet you wanted to get on. I went, geez, no way in the world. Did you see them? And they didn't lose a game for four years until 1990 when we beat them in, um, in Wellington in New Zealand. And then the next year we went on and won the World Cup. And there's another disappointing part. So I had a lot of disappointments because I was dropped the last game before the 1991 Wallabies went to the World Cup where we won. They were my best friends. You think you're in the Wallabies, 87, 88, 89, 90. You're starting fullback, scored a try on debut against the British Lions. It was Now, there was a moment. Um, score a try and you f- finally I got on the field, first test match, British Lions, and then you know, 
And then the last game, they picked a squad of 30. See, now they take 31 to the World Cup, okay? They picked a squad of um, 30. We went and played a midweek game. We had one more test match against the All Blacks in Auckland. We won it. No, we lost it 6-3. But we then beat them in 91 in the semi-final and beat England in the final in 91. But on that Wednesday, we played a game. So the 15, I wasn't in that... Yeah, because I'd done my knee, that's right. At the same knee, I'd had a bit of cartilage, had three weeks out. I was the number one fullback going into 1991, by far. Did my knee, and we played a test against England here to warm up for the World Cup, then played a test against Wales. We beat England by 40 points. We beat Wales by 60 points with this other guy playing fullback, Marty Roebuck. Wonderful player, but he was the, my backup. And then I went, Jesus, this is, I may not go to the World Cup as the number one fullback. But then in the end, after the played a midweek game against um, Counties, which is just south of Auckland, so to make sure the whole World Cup squad had had a game and then the, the starting 15 played against New Zealand on the weekend. Played a game, they made me captain. I thought, geez, what a great honour, that's fabulous. Scored three tries and that night, Peter Fitzsimons you might have heard of, <laughs> Sam Scott Young you might have heard of, Paul Carrozza and I got cut from the squad and sent home to Australia. And Is there reasoning behind that? Well, they could only take, they only took one fullback and I'd uh, had... Three weeks out with a just got a clip off the same knee. So I just had to clean up a little bit of cartilage three weeks out and lost my posse and they only took one full back to the World Cup. Was that so it for my you? My mum and you? dad, that was well, that was it because I'll tell you in a second. Um, my mum and dad had already booked the trip, so they went to the World Cup and I didn't. Oh, <laughs> so, no. So I was so embarrassed. I went and uh, played in Italy. I just wanted to get out. I was so embarrassed that. God, what happened there? I thought I was the fullback for the wall. You think when you're in there, you think you're going to last forever. So I went over there and I was embarrassed and it actually was a stressful time in terms of I just felt so bad. That was Still, it was my dream. I was 20, 26 or whatever by then. Um, yeah, I went over to Italy and then I was in Italy playing because the cash was good over there. We weren't getting paid, so I just went over there and hid. I went and spent – I took off from Italy the night of the – the day of the um, – we were in the World Cup final, the Wallabies. Went up – flew up to London – Went and saw my mates in the dressing room, you know, watched the game, saw my mates in the dressing room, you know, hugged everyone because these were my best friends. This was my group. Um, and then went back to Italy and something, you know, they say you get cancer from stress. I noticed because I'd always had, you know, God, I was a tennis player when I was young, always had little BCCs on the shoulder and arms and stuff cut out. So I'd spent a bit of time in, in doctor's surgeries and I got a tingle in my leg down here, remembering this is the same knee, it might be from the, how much I kicked the ball. I was a left footer. It may be, I always think about it, why did all the shit happen to my left leg? It might be how many times I kicked the ball. But I had a tingle there, and I thought, geez, that's strange. And I went to my doctor, the club doctor in Italy, and said, oh, can you tell me what this is? He said, yeah, see, see, it's a molar. So a mole. And I went, no, 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 I think it's a melanoma because I could feel tingles and, I, and it was weeping and it would change shape, the classic oh, yeah. melanoma. Yeah, yeah, and I went, no, no, no. And I, um, I went, no, 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 there's something more here. There was no internet. There was no, how do you find out? I um, walked out on the club and flew home and um, got mum to ring um, – a doctor here, a specialist here, went and saw her. I went back to – it was, it was pre-season, went back to Reds training that uh, night. So the day I flew in, went to the doctor, went to Reds training, said, I'm back. Oh, you're back a bit early. Great, good one. Went to Reds training. She rang me. Now, you don't go ringing if you're a, a melanoma specialist. You don't go ringing people at 9.30 at night. Mm. Said, whatever time he gets home. No, she'd rung at 8, rung mum at 8, and said, whatever time he gets in, he has to ring me. Um, melanoma. I said, oh, yeah, what does that mean? Uh, I need you to come in because she'd taken a sample that day and they dug this huge hole out of my leg and it was a melanoma. It was a pretty serious one. And then oh, I couldn't play football then because I had a huge hole in my leg that had to heal. And they did try to do that plastic surgery stuff, but there was no use playing footy because it just got ripped open. So, um, yeah, I got back, but I, I would have played a few more games for Queensland. But uh, then I got married and, well, started my carpentry apprenticeship then, so... Wow. Yeah, mate, it's a funny old... What a journey. <laughs> yeah, well, I kept on playing for uni for years. We won nine premierships over my years at university. Not many people play in two grand finals. I played in 12 grand finals, won nine of them. So <laughs> that was keep the, a crunk of the... That was, my, <laughs> that was my true love. My true love was university. So I kept playing after that, but started doing carpentry. So that's fell into it because I came back and I went, shit, I forgot to get a job because I didn't want to work in, in 
phys ed or anything like that. So I started working for my best mate as an apprentice carpenter at the age of 26. Well, I've got so many questions. I've got so many questions. <laughs> I'm going first. Yeah, so, so that, dri- <laughs> that drives you. That tends to drive you. That disappointment. And I, and I never, it, we're talking about mental health, uh, never had an issue. Never had an issue. And then when the cancer, so two years later, so I'm a carpenter for two years, I feel a lump in my groin. All right, because they said just keep an eye on, because that's what happens. All the um, it's like a filtration system. Your um, your lymph yeah. nodes, okay. They said just always keep an eye on the um, in your groin, and I felt a lump one day. I felt another one. There was about three or four in there. I went, hold on. Next thing you know, I'm getting my whole what they call a block dissection. My whole groin ripped open. Oh, mighty! It was, that was horrible too. So, yeah, I've just married, and um, so don't talk about this very often on radio, do I? Um, yeah, and just married, making one hundred and twenty dollars a week. My wife was supporting me. She worked at the Courier Mail selling ads, and and um, we just went one day. We yeah, you know, we'd had a few good cries occasionally, and just said, "We'll be right, we'll be right." And then we developed this idea to because they only gave me a fifty percent chance to live, so I had to go in each month and check out, check out. Then we went right, let's get out of this bog. I took about a month off work to let all this wound heal. Um, let's let's get out of this. Pretend it never happened. We just blocked it completely from our minds, never spoke about it. And, you know, because then the worst thing was it was in the paper. It was on the front page of the paper, former Queensland and Wallaby fullback, 50-50 chance of dying. Now, I don't know where they got that from, but they got it, front page of the Sunday Mail. So, oh therefore, Lord. everyone's first conversa- first question to me, how are you? You know, really sorry, touching me. You know, people touch me. You all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, it's all fine. No, it's all fine. And that's how I spent the next, until they virtually gave me the all clear, it took four years or so. And by that stage, my wife and I went, hold on, who gives us stuff? Let's just have children. So we had two beautiful children and uh, kept working as a carpenter. Mate, far out. Well, I mean, <laughs> Sounds unbelievable. I'm going to pull it back to the to the rugby bit for a second there. Yeah. Because, I mean, the, the build-up to that 99 World Cup, I mean, you would have been on top of the world, as in feeling, holy shit, we right. are, I'm two games away. I'm three weeks away from playing in a World Cup. Uh, it's going to be epic. We've got a team that's bloody got a great chance of winning it. We had, mate. In the third test, we went over and had a... Th- the, you know, these days, they just fly to New Zealand, play them in a test match. We went on a six-week tour to play New Zealand, got the shit bashed out of us and went, all right, we lost the first test. Everyone went, oh, woe for Wallabies. Went a bit better in the second test. Third test, we beat the bastards. No one had beaten them since 1987. So they went through 87, 88, 89 and 1990. No one had beaten them. And finally, we shattered the aura. And that's why we were able to go into 1991 so and beat confidence. them in that semi-final. We just yeah. finally looked across and went, hold on, two arms, two legs, let's get these pricks. Yeah, so, I mean, just... Take us back to that moment when, like, how were you told? Was it the coach that came and told you? Was it some assistant? Was it one of your teammates? Like, run us through that Mate, moment. I don't even remember. I, th- I think it was the team manager said, now, listen, we all know there was only 26 because we'd been in camps and all that sort of... First, it was the second World Cup, so we sort of knew from the first one, right, oh, this is big. Because what happened, the, U- the European countries, the Northern Hemisphere countries, they didn't want the World Cup. They said, this would be hopeless. So they let Australia and New Zealand run the first one, and they went... Wow, what was that? So they snatched it back for the second World Cup. We went, this is going to be big. So Bob Dwyer, um, and I don't hold anything against him now sort of thing, but um, uh, I was, it, it would just, sometimes maybe I was the person that had to get out of the squad for it to click. Maybe that was it. But we were in a good space. That Wallabies team at that stage in the early 90s was incredible. We had Michael Liner, Tim Ho- I played through the final pass for Tim Horan's first try in Test Rugby, through the final pass for... Jason Little's first try and test rugby. So, oh, they they we, both we were the, uh, they went to Downlands and Toowoomba Grammar, isn't it? That's correct. Yeah, that's so, right. I've heard about those glory days. They were one, well. We had a wonderful team. So, and I exited that. Yeah, it was the team manager. But you know, I was in pretty good company with Paul Carrozza, Sam Scott Young, and Peter Fitzsimons also getting admitted. So, I was bitter for a fair you while. You would have been there. filthy. Well, absolutely filthy. But as I said to you, embarrassed. And I reckon that I reckon the disappointment led to the cancer. Wow. Somehow I, I believe that's how it happens. I, I don't know because yeah. it was within six months that I had melan- diagnosed with melanoma. And you are right. Like stress comes out of you in some in some I way. It manifests from that moment. Yeah. So I determined never to be stressed ever again. Yeah. Wow. What what that gave me that you know when I came out the other side of you know two years later. So you yeah. had the melanoma out. And I went. Oh, I'm just going to have to deal with this and get my checkups and hopefully everything's all right. And wore a hat every day of my life. I always have ever since then. 
And then the then the block dissection, you know, when they took my lymph nodes out and said, yeah, you're a 50-50 chance because what happens? It gets caught in there. You've got about 16 lymph nodes in there. And mine was in four. That's very serious, which means it's probably gone throughout your body, but it didn't. So that was lucky, but that gave me a complete fearlessness in life. And when somebody tells you a 50-50 chance of, of dying and um, – I've never spoken about this. My wife and I know the story. My mm. parents know the story. I've mm. never really talked about it. It gave me – I wasn't scared of – I wasn't fearful of anything at all. So I'm not just talking about walking around on top plates or anything like that at work. I'm talking about life. I took chances, to did, did anything. Off, I just had no fear. We had no children at that stage. Mm. I reckon I didn't get fear back for her until my kids got to about – 12 or 13, God. I thought, I've got to look after myself because they're starting to grow up. So as in you weren't like you were just not afraid of death or you just weren't afraid of anything? You, you were weren't just afraid like, of anything. Afraid. Not not afraid of failure, not fa- like afraid Nothing. of physically harming yourself. Yeah, and there were things, know. yeah, never had bad dreams, never had anything. We just, I replaced, something replaced everything. So as I say to you, stress and bitterness. Um, yeah, and that's why from then on I just started saying yes to any jobs. Like next thing you know, you know, by four, five, four years, five years later, when did Fox start? Five years later, they uh, I was the first commentator on Fox. Like, they didn't have any rugby commentators. Started working there, said yes. I, I didn't know how to commentate. So, yeah, it gave me a, it gave me a real good groove. For, you know, somehow, cancer gave me a real good path in life. So when the doctors yeah. say to you, are you stressed? You know, just in general, the people ask you, you know, are you stressed? Yeah. Keep your stress down. It's not just a figure of speech. Like, oh, because I'm right with you there. I, yeah. I really feel like that that stuff manifest, manifests. I, I'm a big believer. Physically. Yeah. And, yeah, I've heard that many stories similar. Yeah. So, it's, yeah, it's just incredible. It was funny. Yeah. Oh, not funny, but uh, it was just – and it's something, you know, I don't talk about. It just happened. It was just something I switched on. And maybe it was the strength of – Getting over the knee injury and things like that, you get some sort of inner strength. And Had that uh, resilience. Yeah. Yes. But we talk about how much I talk in life now. I didn't talk in those days. Well, you, know, you guys are chippies. You, you go to work and you do your job. You know, you'd, you'd if have you a don't talk, you're just talking out. shit. Yeah. Gee, yeah, I don't know. Shit. For us, the two of us worked together. We spoke a fair bit of shit with each other. Well, shit, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you'd never talk about anything. Yeah, you wouldn't talk about. Nothing hey, meaningful. Yeah, you know mm. what happened to me. You know why I'm, I feel strong in life. You know why this happens because... Well, things, events shape you and it depends how you deal with the event. That embarrassment that you were talking about of getting dropped, it just makes me imagine what it must be like now for players because oh. there's no social media then, is there? You know no, what I mean? No, it's like, mate. Like, oh, can you imagine it now? Imagine Darius Boyd, Instagram. what he's gone through this year. Mate, yeah. and I've been one of the person people who have been up him. So uh, yeah, well, I, I've I mean, been leading the charge on that because... I'm a believer. If someone's paying eight hundred thousand dollars. Cope <laughs> yeah. with it. I'm. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know what you mean. But my my, I'm just saying back on how he would. It's just how he would be perceiving oh, all that. You know, mate. how would he be taking all that on? When you talk like that, yeah, I feel I feel bad for what I do, but that's my job. When oh, I have a microphone, if I if I don't yeah. speak honestly, um, no one's going to listen to me. <laughs> yeah. If you don't speak yeah. honestly, and I and that's how I that's how I commentate. Of too. course, if the referee's crap, if a prop's not pushing, if a guy can't run anymore, if he's too old. I say it, and I think that was part of the fearlessness. I've never had a fear of, oh, I might hurt his feelings. I, d- I don't care. I don't. Uh, maybe I should be nicer to people, and I am on well, one-on-one, but while generally commentating on radio or TV, I don't care. But I think that's a big difference where you're – like, that is what – and people want to hear that because, I mean, if everyone was just peaches and roses the whole time, it, it wouldn't work. So, They're I mean, seeing it. They're yeah, seeing exactly. It. I can't bullshit. No, of course. But what I'm saying is, is um, for him as a person, imagine, um, like, you know, he's had such a amazing career. I mean, he's won two premierships, he's played or- 29 Origins and played for Australia. And for him now, it must just be such a weird complex. I don't know why a- he keeps doing it. Well, because he could have, you know, I'm not going to go down this whole Darius Wood thing, but it's sort of he could have easily. Gone, said I'm I'm out of here, um, and checked out earlier. Um, but he's sort of stuck around. It must just yeah, it's been an interesting thing that he's going through currently. I like think it, it must just it just comes with also just being in the public eye. That's like what I mean. Not it, just sports sports people, you know, anyone anyone yeah. who's you know, I mean, politicians. Oh, I'm not going to go down that path either. But absolutely <laughs> anyone in the public eye just gets scrutinised, and I guess that comes. Mate, with the I, get, I, I get I get. I, I know I cop a bollocking. Like, you, you, know, yeah. you, you can't be in the media. You know that probably only 50% of the people like you and there's another 50% absolutely hate you. Because so it's well, quite polarising. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's my job. One yeah, of my yeah. jobs is to say things and the boss will say at work, he said, I don't care whether what you say is right or wrong, friggin' say it. Are you allowed to swear on this podcast? Mate, fucking oath, yeah. Right. <laughs> well, he says fucking say it. And... Um, 
And you know, I, I get protective because I, I don't go to, oh, I've got Facebook, but only you know, a few thousand friends, et cetera, but I don't do Instagram. I don't put, I don't make that part of my platform, Yeah, social media. I've got a microphone every week. Now, I've been in fights, Twitter fights. Some people are fighting me on Twitter like Matt Gitto and uh, James O'Connor. I was having a blue oh, that's there right. Wade <laughs> Cooper. Yeah. Having a blue there because I was telling the honest truth. You know, I was telling what I saw and what every other football fan was seeing, that they weren't at their top level and they were stuffing around and they were wasting opportunities like Nick Kyrgios. You say that and then they'll battle against you in Twitter yeah. and I'll go, hold on, I've got a microphone on TV and radio. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I can keep this going. I had to ring his manager, James O'Connor, because he was a solicitor that had done some stuff for me um, and say, so, mate, I know a lot more than what I've unleashed so far. Do you want me to keep going? So you had to just well, the other, one down. The other yeah. thing is, is you're coming at it from a from a place of, you know, having been dropped before that World Cup. You've had a taste for it. You I've know had what people it's tell like. me reality. Yeah, and you and you like you know what you know, you know what it's like to be out there. So maybe you, I should be kinder it. to them. No, I no, not at all. I mean you you know what it's like to relish that opportunity mm. and having been dropped at that stage yeah, it's I think been that's taken away from that's definitely what you. it is. So yeah. you, you're coming at it from having played and having loved it so much and then looking at these guys probably thinking what, what you'd kill Don't to waste your opportunity. You'd kill to be yeah. doing it because you know so right. You never know when it's going to be cut short. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's my criticism of Nick Kyrgios. Christ almighty, what a waste of talent. Well, you just, like, the thing, the whole thing with the Nick Kyrgios thing, I just look at John Milman, right? And he oh, was, he was, he was in Millman. year He was in year 12. <laughs> <laughs> he was in year 12 and I was in grade 8. And, I mean, John, I mean, he came out, he was, he's been on tour for a quite a long time, but he left school when I, uh, in 2006. End of 2006. Yeah. No, one, no one had a clue who he was, but he was out there chipping away and he's been the hardest working Australian tennis player in the last 10 years and he's just finally starting to get recognition but he still doesn't get the recognition he deserves I, well, I told you I was a tennis player when I was young played at uh, my school we won the GPS premiership three years in a row I was captain of tennis two of those years okay that was supposed to be my sport and then I realised the chicks don't dig tennis players they dig footy players first 15 players playing GPS etc there's a party on every Saturday night that's why I started getting serious about footy but uh, the John Millman thing. So I'd always wanted... My mum was supposed to go to Wimbledon and play when she was young. Met my dad and never went. All right? So I always wanted to go to Wimbledon oh, just for one day. Walked in there two years ago, okay? Three years ago. Three years ago. Walked in there with a group of uh, another family from Brisbane. Took My daughter was over there having a gap year. My wife and I and her and this other family. We walked in. Nick Kyrgios is on court too. That was the option. They went in to watch him. I went, no. John Millman's playing on this little backcourt over here. He fought this Spanish brick wall for five sets and took about three and a half hours. I reckon we had about eight pims. We were mighty pissed. <laughs> I started yelling out Queenslander to him after about the first two games and he went, I've got friends here. And uh, people over Wimbledon, any Queenslander there, started coming and flocking to him as he played. So I had the chance to see Kyrgios. I went, we went and saw Millman, my wife and daughter and I all went on, sen- on, all went on the court after. I love the bloke. This was, yeah. It is one of the greatest days of my life, the day I chose Millman with a five-setter against some Spanish nobody and he won it. And Kyrgios, Kyrgios I always, I've said it on radio probably half a dozen times. I said it at my father's funeral. Kyrgios killed my father. Well, he was a big, my father. I remember Kyrgios had that bad year. It was the year before 2004. 15, I guess. Jesus, dad been gone that? No, probably 2016. You know, whatever. That year that he was really playing up. Dad was at my sister's house. Mum was away down in Sydney. Dad was at my sister's house about to have dinner. The news was on. Okay, the sport came on and they detailed again what Kyrgios was up to. Dad's last words were, so this is 10 to 7 at night, just at the end of the sport, I wouldn't give the fucking prick a feed and dad died. Are you kidding you me? kidding. Wow. So I get a phone call. My sister lives at Kira. I get a phone call in the new market and we rush down. Dad was still warm, but he was well and truly dead. My nephew and my brother-in-law worked on him for a while. They were his last words. Kyrgios killed my father. How's that? That's are you allowed to oh say that? On? Are we, are we allowed to it's laugh about that? I don't I know you sure are. Make it Mate, you sure are. It's just, it's a thing. So <laughs> oh, how do you reckon shit. I feel about Nick Kyrgios? So I walk into Wimbledon 
um, a few months later, I'm not going to go and watch him play and cheer him, am I? That actually what? gave me, uh, when you said you walked in there, and I'm, a, I'm from Sydney, I'm a New South Wales man. Right but when you <laughs> yeah. said that. That's about how the, that's the response, yeah, right. When you said that, <laughs> that's right, you're here. When you, when you said that thing about yelling out Queenslander to John Milman, oh, that did give me tingles just then because I could imagine that for a bloke like that. Can you imagine? On the, the other crowd. side of the world. Yeah. yeah, no one there. There was eight people watching him and yeah. there was 5,000 watching Kyrgios. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm going, we're in the right place here. And he looked up when he got the first Queens and he went, oh, yeah, good on you, mate. Go, yeah. son. And then we just kept on doing it. Did you know who you were? No idea at all. We introduced <laughs> ourselves after Perfect. the match and just went, love you. I've interviewed him a couple of times since then. Millman and my daughter was trying to crack onto him after that. But he's, <laughs> he's, mate, he's rock and roll, isn't he? Um, she he loved Federer it. Like she got onto him on Instagram. I don't think it was the day. It wasn't the tournament he beat Federer. He got, he got, he went deep that year. Like he got to the fourth round. Yeah. Or something. yeah. But there, all right, that says who I am. I'm a Millman guy, not a Kyrgios guy. That's, mate. Well, you're in good company. Pretty well sums <laughs> it up, mate. Yeah, it's awesome. Did you haven't Churchy produced some bloody sports? Some sports. Well, that mate. year, the year before that, 2005, was all the Pocock, Quaid. Yeah. What a year. Um, then we had, uh, the year after then, we had Aiden, Aiden um, what's his name? Toa. Aiden Toa come through. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Aiden played fullback. Um, but he, I went to uni with his dad, Aiden. Yeah, right. Yeah. No, yeah, he was in my boarding house, actually. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, did you go to Churchy? Yeah, our good one boy. Now, do you remember? <laughs> Do you know that Millman went to grammar first? I'm a Brisbane grammar Yes, yeah, so I have heard this. I never tell this on radio because uh, it doesn't appeal to blue-collar workers and tradies that I found myself, which, how do you find yourself a carpenter after going to grammar? But Jesus <laughs> came in handy because people who went to grammar who are now become the doctors, lawyers and la, la, la. They need someone to renovate. <laughs> they don't know any tradies <laughs> and they trust a bloke who they went to school with. So that was very, a good decision. A niche. So if I'd say, and now my son went to grammar, I don't know why I paid for him. He's an apprentice carpenter. <laughs> so the same thing will turn around from him. All his friends are la di da. Well, actually, after one year at uni, a lot of his mates dropped out and became uh, apprentice carpenters too. That's happening a lot. It's Love your trades. Lot. Yeah, hundred percent. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. I mean, because you can't beat the work ethic that you that, that you build by doing a trade and getting oh out God, the tools. Yeah. You just can't beat that. That yeah. But on top, the demand's always there. As in, like. We've always said if this thing falls over tomorrow, we can just go straight back on the tool. It's not going to be hard for us to get a job. All my jobs were, I think we've built like, one brick house in our life. All my jobs were timber jobs and timber is always going to need renovating. And every woman that goes into a house wants to be like a dog and piss over it. Even if they spend $2 million, they always want a reno done because they want to say, look what I did. Yeah. No, you didn't, love. We did all that. <laughs> Mate, can I can I take you back to the stuff around the melanoma because that was severe. Like that's really obviously quite hectic. That and, was and really hectic. I wonder in the process of of uh, processing that afterwards, and you said that you you and your wife just made the decision to block just it. Denied out. it. Now was that? Tell me, was that because you didn't want to talk about it, or you didn't? You hadn't come so. to terms with it or you just didn't thought that th was yeah. the best way to move forward for All right, it. now there's a melanoma. Now there's now there's groups that talk about it and I've been involved in the early days and then I sort of dropped off and went, this isn't my gig anymore, I'm over my melanoma. But um, MPA, melanoma, jeez, what was it called? It was early days and I watched a guy die while he started this association and I went, he was, a, uh, he was an offsider to my accountant and he was dying of melanoma while trying to help others. There was no help. Like, And my surgeon was a bloke who was 65 or so. He was no help. There was no internet. Mm. Um, we went to the library at some stage and got a, got an encyclopedia. Imagine on that. Going that, to the that's library. That's how you look shit up. So, yeah. But there was no one to help you. There was no one to hold your hand. Now now there is. There's people who have had melanoma will we'll help guide you through and go, listen, yeah, that's not too bad. This is what will happen. There was nothing. So we went home, looked at each other and went, Shit, like if somebody tells you you got cancer, and oh, you know, and you're 26, and you and you got no money, you got no nothing. Um, yeah, yeah, that that was tough. My wife's pretty tough though too, so she's a chick from Rocky. So her old, but her dad was a doctor, but a gynecologist. So but that wasn't much help. People said, oh, you know, they should be all right now. They cut it all out of you because melanoma, you can't do chemo or anything. They just keep cutting and cutting and cutting. So, um, yeah, there was, there, was, there was no one to talk to, so I don't know how I... Yeah. don't know how I survive. Yeah. No, I, it's, I a, it's, it's, a, it's a hard one. It must have been a really difficult one to... Pro I mean... But that's why we didn't talk. Yeah. We just said... It's easy just happen. to... 
It's easy yeah. to bury your head, I suppose. But then on the other side of it is, you know, when you've got people who don't know how to uh, how to approach you about it. As you were saying, people touching you on the arm going, and that's why I push right. them away. And then you, you kind of don't want to be treated any differently, I would imagine. Oh, well, I'm in the process of trying to deny that it ever happened and I'm better. Yeah. Look, at me. Look I was better. I went when the wounds... Almost were, delusional. I was. Yeah. Because we didn't know any better. Now, what would you do? You'd go to Dr. Google and look up every single case of melanoma in the last 20 years yeah. and go, right, that worked, that worked, that worked. I'll tell you what did work. This woman, um, you would know Pat Howard, his name is. He played 5-8 for the Wallabies. His mother, now he's one of only, geez, he's the only one, grandfather. He's the only case in Australian rugby. Grandfather was Cyril Towers, who was Randwick Rugby, invented running rugby at Randwick, okay? Cyril Towers, Jake Howard, his father, and he. It's the only... Um, only, what do you call that? Three. It's the only grandfather, father and son who played for yeah, the three yeah. generational. Righto. Um, she was also a good rugby coach, his mother. Oh, so right. she came over and she'd heard about it. All right, this is this is what, what went down. Sorry, in terms of being in denial, I, while the wound healed, I made a decision. Um, used to smoke, used to eat meat, used to do drink a lot. And, you know, used to enjoy, you know, as in drink a lot, as in on Fridays and stuff like that after you finish work. So while I was recovering for that, would have been four or six weeks while the wound healed, she came over and she told me a story about how her brother was supposed to get hind corded, which means everything from the hip, he had cancer, everything from the hip, he was supposed to get done through here, okay? Everything cut off. All right? I said, yeah, why are you telling me this? She said, well, I know about your operation. She was, the, she was probably the major person who reached out to me. I said, yeah. She said, we made him better. I went, What? She said, we cured him. I went, you know, well, there is no cure for cancer. She, sa- she said he was within three or four weeks of being hindquartered. And he said, hold on, hold on. They, they fed him. Um, she had this industrial-sized juicer. Well, now you just have a, bull- a magic bullet. Magic bullet, bullet yeah. <laughs> They had this industrial size. She said, just juice everything. I stopped eating any food. For six months, I stopped eating food and juiced every single thing. I don't know. Do you believe in miracles? I don't know. She was the most wonderful. And after six months, I still I started eating meat again. Went, I don't know. I can't keep doing this. I said to Kath, I can't keep doing this. This is bullshit. <laughs> but we were I, maybe that maybe that did something to my body. I don't know. And I tell people, I don't know. Well, I, I think I, that's I a big placebo type thing. You maybe know, it is. Like, or maybe I, fruits that amazing because our family's from Stanthorpe. I always ate fruit, yep. so I was comfortable doing this for six months. Wow. Um, but shit, it had cured this bloke. Of he was about to have his whole leg and hind quarter cut off around his pelvis, everything gone. Next thing you know, she he juiced for months and months and months. So I went, oh, you, you no, do. Well, I got a different yeah. cancer, but maybe you do hear those stories I because think, you. Well, I believed of, it. Yeah, well, a lot of people too. Um, it is <laughs> based around your diet. It is definitely based around your diet. Well, Kathy, I mean, one of my best mates, she had stage four melanoma. Yeah, yeah right. Five, on. six years ago, she should have died. She was she all right? She's she's alive and kicking. She's you beat it. Melanoma in the upper body. Uh, um, it was originally. Right, I know, we'll see. It would have got caught under yeah. here in these lymph nodes. She probably got money cut off. Well, mate, what I was going to say is, yeah, same thing. I mean, she, you know, she sort of maintained a quarter holistic lifestyle. Yeah. I'm going to say, and and you know, yeah. good juices and only healthy, you know, vegan diet and all that sort of stuff. And sure, you know, I think that plays a massive part to it. But I think psychologically. You start to believe that you're doing all the good stuff as well, and I think that's a that mind over matter Clears is a your huge brain part of it. Yeah. I, like I really do believe I, that. So I agree with you. It doesn't surprise well, me. We disappeared from life. We just cut ourselves off for six months. Yeah, and it goes back to I guess also that what we were talking about before with the, the idea that stress manifests physically. Yeah, well, saying that I mean the, the mind can be a bloody powerful thing. God, so, yeah, I, I agree. I don't think we've even tapped into. Right, geez, I'm getting you bogged down. Sorry, boys. Not at all. But this is what it's all about, mate. It's a real life chat. Oh, so I've never told want. this story before. So. No, no, not at all. I oh, appreciate yeah. you sharing it with us. To be honest, it's bloody awesome. No, it's boring. But yeah. no, but it's not. But it's this is what the, these things made me who I am now. They yeah. made me. I, I wasn't a talker. I could speak at anything these days. But yeah, if somehow that this shit that went on, the disappointment, and then the cancer, made me who I've been in the last twenty years. Yeah, it's an amazing, amazing turnaround to think that this is where you've ended up now. Compared mm. to back in that day, you probably thought, "Oh shit, I'm just going to be." I don't know. Probably didn't know what you were going to do. No, well, I was going to be a carpenter and do renos. And then we started lifting houses. Like most of our work was lifting houses, building in under. And that's what I was happy to I was really happy doing that because I loved it. 
maybe because I didn't have to do it from the age of 17. I was fresh at the age of 25, 26, whenever I started. I loved it. And then all of a sudden TV happened and then all of a sudden radio happened. I never had any amb- no ambition whatsoever. Well, let's talk about that transition to, to radio. Um, you were working on a house you set in whereabouts? Near in Hawthorne. Hawthorne actually, not yeah. far up the road where we are now. Um it was a good mate of mine, Anthony Merlo. He said, mate, 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 I've got this good mate. And I'd just finished doing a reno for him at New Farm. He said, mate, I've got this good mate of mine. Yeah, and he always talk fast. And uh, I said, yeah, what is it? He said, it's, it's right up your alley. It's a big fucking deck and we've got to add on. Bloody, he wants a wing on and, yeah, righto. So I went, oh, yeah, righto. So he said he works on radio. He did tell me he worked on radio, but that didn't impress me. Like, that didn't mean anything. Um, got the plans, gave him a quote. Uh, yeah, I think we did a quote. Do we... I might have done a cost plus, which was always appealing. Yeah, folks know. Oh, awesome. That sounds yeah. all right. <laughs> <laughs> that used to go on, mate. Can't yeah. go wrong. I would say that's if I go back, that's what I'll be ever ever do. I'll never do anything but cost plus these days. Hey, um, so I did that. So what he used to do is then we'd have myself and my mate Shorey, a young bloke called Kev, and a labourer sometimes, and my dad. My dad had retired, and Mum said, "You've got to get him out of the house. He's driving me insane." After you know, he'd retired early. Um, so he worked for me for 10 years as a carpenter, my old man. He tried to take over the business and give everyone financial advice and shit. We were used to mainly talking about who got arrested on the weekend and Dad tried to <laughs> talk to them about, have you got enough super? Oh, jeez. <laughs> anyway, so he'd come along every day and he was obviously working on radio and I didn't give that any thought. Come along and he'd have a carton every day. How good's that? A carton of beer every day and we'd have three or four beer stubbies and drive home. And while we are having the stubby, we'd have a ciggy or a cigarette and a beer and then... Hop in our utes and drive home, tell a few stories. And uh, we were about a month into the job and a mate rang me at night one night. Shit, I think it was just the start of mobile phones too. I think he did have to, because we used to, can I tell you an old story? <laughs> We'd have to go home and make all your calls. You'd work on the tools all day. Jeez, you got a lot more work done. I don't know how. Oh, yeah, you would have too. Yeah. Focus on the You'd yeah. have to go home. Someday you get home at four, make any phone calls that had to be made before five, and then make the calls to future clients and everyone else after. It was a pain. I, d- I always just think how they order concrete. Like how they organise the concrete trucks. I'll, I'll meet you there. I'll be just there. Just trying to think. Well, it's happening. Well, you had to be. Yeah, you know what I mean? You had to be ready. Like we're doing it and yeah. it's like there's no... There's a bit of disappointment. And, if you, need, and if you need any extra, if you're under... If, 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 you, if yeah. you, you're, you're under sure. your calculations... Yeah. God, you would, was, God, they were funny days. The early days of those bricks, I can remember my blocky had one and one of the plasters had one. They had the big brick. It was out in the car connected to the... Connected to the... Um, Connected to the horn, actually. No, the Bricky had one, and the plasterer had one, a mobile phone, which was enormous as well, but he had it in the house, and we used to always ring the Bricky's number, and he'd have to run out to the car, and then you'd hang up. Anyway, that's a side <laughs> story. Early days of phone. So someone rang me and said, hey, listen, are you doing a job for a bloke called, can I use his name? Well, yeah. He's fine. He works on TV and stuff, Dean Miller. Yeah. I said, yeah. Oh, yeah, why? And they said, he's telling stories about you on radio, and we were Triple J listeners, thinking we were all still young and stuff. And... Um, and I went, yeah, well, what sort of stories? Oh, just you blokes, what you've been up to and your stories from years ago and stories out of Gundy and Stan, you know, he's telling drunk stories about you and all sorts of things. I went, oh, yeah, that's all right. Didn't think any of it. So because the beer was coming every day, it was wonderful having a client because he'd be home. He'd finish his breakfast show. Uh, he was the breakfast show host at uh, Triple M. So he'd finish at 10 o'clock in the morning. He'd be home at 11. we go, no, we can't drink at 11 in the morning. <laughs> We'll wait until we finish at 3.34. He's a pretty we'll good a pretty good client. Don't oh, work, boys. Just oh, get on the tins. Well, he was keen to. So, <laughs> And so there, this went on. He, we became great friends. We became holiday friends after this job. We did a great job for him and all the rest of it. But the boss, boss asked him one day, um, the boss at Triple M, Jimmy Johnson, great fella, he said to him, um, who's this bloke who's the builder? And he said, oh, a bloke called Greg Martin. He said, what, the rugby bloke? And Dean... I, I didn't stand around talking rugby. We used to talk about just because rugby was finished for me. Rugby was all over. And uh, he went, oh, I don't know, I'll check. So he did. He said, do you play rugby? I said, yeah, yeah, I played for the Wallabies years ago. And then uh, I'm now, I'm a, what year are we? Jesus. I'm now 36 or so. So I'm I'm a builder. I've got no desire to work yeah. on radio. I never thought about it. And um, the boss rang me when he told the boss, yeah, it's the Wallaby guy. Um, and I'd, or, I'd just started commentating for Fox Sports, who... Just started on air in 96, started there, and they didn't have any commentators. And the reason I was working on Fox Sports, because they said to Jason Little and Tim Horan, who I spoke to you before about, is there anyone, any former, recently former players, 
um, who'd make a good commentator. And I used to stand at fullback because they were both wonderful defenders. And I'd go, oh, Horan's hammered him. I'd commentate while they were hitting people while we were playing Queensland and test matches and stuff. <laughs> oh, look at Little, that's magnificent. And also, as I'd score tries, oh, Martin, that's beautiful. <laughs> if you were scoring an easy try, like a runaway try, I'd commentate while I was doing it. And they went, I'll tell you, because they were nice enough, the two of them, to say, um, I'll tell you who you should have a go at is Marto. He'd, he'd be all right. He commentates on the field. <laughs> So and there was there's no commentator school. You just, yeah. you just and they rang me in the first year of Super Rugby in '96 when Fox Sports opened their doors. Did a few games and a few more, and I've been there ever since. So I'd already been in with them for about three or four years. Just yeah, there's no great fame in that. I was just a commentator. I wasn't the face. I was the voice. Yeah. And um, the boss said, "Oh, the rugby commentator," and la la la. Then he rang me up. The, the Triple N guy rang me up, and I found myself in there and. And he said, oh, you should do our sports show. I said, well, yeah, I love sport. He said, well, you work for Fox Sports, perfect fit. I went, yeah, well, I love all sport. Yeah, sure, what do you got to do? He said, just turn up on Saturday, which was tough because I liked having a drink after I'd finished, you know, I'd stop with football. We'd have a drink on a Friday. So after you used to turn up and do this sports show from, shit, 8 until 11, so you'd have a hangover and you'd be doing it. But it obviously went all right. Next thing you know, I had the job within three months or so, two months, had the job on the breakfast show with Dean. And then poor Dean one day, so come the next year. So then they said, do you want to work? And I said, oh, well, they said, can you replace this girl on the breakfast show? There was three weeks until Christmas and she went and had a little operation. They said, oh, we need a replacement. I said, well, no, no, fuck. I've got, you know how busy you are going into Christmas? Yeah, everyone wants I've got these done. jobs to finish. I've promised people we'll be working right up to Christmas Eve. Um, I've got, no, I can't. They said, well, we'll give you a thousand. I think they'll give me a, it might have been, was it a thousand dollars a week? No, I couldn't. No, it was something. It was a decent coin. I said, "Oh yeah, sure, right." I, I said, "I got to be finished by nine fifteen every day." So I do these radio shows with Greg Ritchie, the fat cat. What yeah, a okay. magnificent human being. It was funniest. We was just rolling. We were so wrong. We'd be taken off air within a day. That now, um, we'd just be rolling, telling. I'd be telling old footy stories. He'd tell old cricket stories, and we'd fall apart. And you know, it was ha happy days. So then the three weeks is up, and I go, "Right, that was fun. See ya." He said, "Listen, do you want to do this permanently?" And I went. Well, no, I've got a building company. I've got two apprentices. I've got my mate, Shorey. I've got this young bloke, Kev. I've got my old man works for me. He said, well, we're sure we could work something out. And he named a figure, and it was pretty good. Like, it was over 100 grand. Wow. And I'm This is 18 years ago. And we weren't making... This is 18 years ago. Yeah, oh. we weren't making any fucking money. Be but more I told him, I said, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> we go pretty well. Well, I'm running a pretty successful building company. And then... Um, then I went, oh, right I So I, I think he added another 20 grand. So I've gone, but I've still got to run the building company because I could, you know, I didn't trust anyone. You know, I didn't trust the bastard and I had to look after, you know, I had four workers. So you and were, we had six months of work built, uh, booked up. So for the first three years on radio, the first two years I kept working full time. Jeez, that was hard. Like I'm getting up at 3.30, 3.21 every morning. And then going to building, and then it, it was tough work. After about two years, I went, hold on, this looks like it's going to keep going. So my poor mate, I, had, I got rid of the apprentices. One had finished. One I passed off to somebody else. I'm sorry, I had Joey as well, another carpenter. Gave him to somebody. Sure, he worked with, yeah, the, everyone, placed everyone after about two years, two and a half years, and just did radio. So And mate, 18 years later, a, yeah, they haven't sacked me. That is such a huge gamble. That was like a, such a huge gamble for you, I suppose. As in, like, it took a big. No, it wasn't. Cause no, it was but still I mean, building. as in, yeah, I know. But as in, like, you were, you were, you were running yourself probably into the ground over those two years. You would have been rooted. You still, you know, you, know, you guys will find out. You don't get tired until you're in your fifties and sixties. <laughs> I think. Yeah, you know, I just had endless energy. energy yeah, mate, I was still at this stage happy to be alive. Yeah, and and now by this stage I had young kids. Like I had one and two year old. That's when you went until you. Start having kids. That's when you go. If you feel this responsibility, I started losing some of my. I said when the kids were ten. I reckon soon after they were born, I started to get shit. This is serious yeah. now. I got to be responsible. I can't be Bit fearless, fearless Marto. Um, and that's how it all happened. So that period, that period of their doing the doing the double hustle for, yeah. for two years, was it? That's hard, mate. Yeah, that's, that's oh, hardcore. It was so hard. It yeah. was so tough. I don't. I don't know how we did it, but I think. Working with Greg Ritchie, it was it was easy days, and we're more creative now. In those days, we were just telling old stories. You must have thought they're taking the piss, or like you must well, have thought the whole situation, the whole thing's kind of taking the I, piss here. Like I was what, an accidental hero, yeah. oh, an accidental radio person. Yeah, no, it's so. incredible, and it's just you've just been riding the wave ever since. Well, yeah, I guess it's riding the <laughs> wave, but 
Then I look at Scotty Cam and I wish I was him because he gets, <laughs> he gets paid proper money, like triple, you know, triple M Brisbane. You know, you know, you don't get paid that much. So we wear a Scotty. Shit, he gets millions. I'm very jealous of that that I didn't get onto that early. That would have been great. But it was. I understood the people we were talking to because normally these radio dudes are freaks who were 14 and they always wanted to work on radio mm. and they didn't have they didn't know a life or comedians. They've never had a job. They didn't have life, life experience. They have life. Yeah. I, had, I probably, I was a 50th a few years ago and my wife made a stubby holder with all the jobs I'd held because we weren't getting paid to play 40. I'd had about 40, 50 jobs before I became a carpenter. So yeah, yeah, I was a wow. funeral, funeral director, I was a bus driver, <laughs> I was a truck driver. You're kidding me. No, nah, everything, mate, because you couldn't, because next thing you know, you'd have a job for a while, then you go overseas and they go, oh, well, I can't have that. Or you'd break a finger and, oh, sorry, you'd have to move on to the next job. I was How an aerobics instructor at one stage. <laughs> Shut up. Mate, all these How things. long were you a funeral director for? My sister owned Logan Funerals for 32 years. Wow. So there was, I don't know if I should tell this in public, but <laughs> no, I should It's only the three of us. Yeah. <laughs> so I, um, she got me when I went, oh, yeah. Should tell this, but my brother-in-law got me. All right, I'll tell you the first job. I'd, I'd been out real late, and it was a Saturday morning. I said I'd love to work. This is why I'm playing footy, looking for any jobs you can get hold of. Sold life insurance for three weeks. How's that? I feel so sorry for those two people. I sold life insurance to. My, my sister said, "Do you want to do some work? Pickups, which means body dead, mm. dead body mm. in a house. Go around there in the uh, panel van." With the, with the artificial grass in the back, go in with a stretcher, get the body. First one was an 83-year-old lady who'd been dead for three weeks at St Lucia in, oh, in February. Oh. Can you imagine oh. how that was? And the family's all wailing in the uh, lounge room. Oh, Jesus, no. that hardens you up. And then go to the funerals. That's another thing that hardened me up, working there too. Oh. Seeing, going to funerals and just standing there as I was only 23 and stuff. Going, you know, that gave me a, that gave me a sense of solemnity, I think. Yeah, like I yeah. just learned, geez, it was tough. Kids' funerals and mothers, you know, young mothers, mothers of ch young children's funerals. Oh. Old people, I used to go, gave me a real good sense of the world. Old people, I'd go, they had a fair, I'd listen to the, um, so, you know, the, the people speaking about them. i go, oh, good, good old digger. He was 82. He had a fair old run or she had a great old run, but it was the young people that died that I, yeah. Woo. Really got to compartmentalise that yeah. sort of stuff, don't oh, you? Just uh, block it. Are we all good at that? No. All oh, right, no. I am. I think maybe I am. Maybe that's my strength. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's, it's that's, you know. It's but they, denial. That's what they teach you in the military. I think it's all about compartmentalising yeah. both, phys both physically the and Jesus, it psychologically. Blow up. Maybe I'm going to blow up one day with all these, because that's what happens to them, isn't it? They don't talk enough and then they blow up. Oh, we're talking about it right now. Uh, you sound pretty mm. open to me, mate. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, well, no one's asked me before. Yeah. Oh, so, well. well, this is what we're here for. See, and this is what I was, this brings me to the next thing I want to ask is because Obviously, you, people listen to you every day, so they feel like they know you. Oh, God, yeah. People, uh, I'll go anywhere because I'm in your toilet I'm, while you're having a shit. I'm in your car. I'm in your kitchen. I'm, I'm everywhere. I'm, I'm your friend. The, the amount of time I walk, the good thing is radio. Not everyone knows what I look like. Yeah, I like Ellen, that. Yeah. If they stop fucking putting billboards up, no one would know what I look <laughs> like. So people will just start having a conversation of, uh, to you about something you I covered off on. You've got to remember, I'll talk about 12 to 15 things a day. They'll talk to me about something I spoke to and it really, it really touched them three months ago and they'll just continue that conversation. I'll go, hold on, hold on, what, what, what was I talking about again? Oh, wow. So it, you, there's an old saying in radio that no one can quote it, no one will remember exactly what you said, but they remember how you made them feel. That's the power of radio. That, the, and I made them feel good. I'm, you've got to make them laugh and you've got to make them cry. And that's well, – well, I've, I've always been open. And that's – wow. but it would go both ways, wouldn't it? Because you'd, you'd obviously, you know, you, you must piss people off oh, sometimes. Do I ever? You make people feel good. I've got producers who who won't let them talk to me. So they'll block emails that they'll have hatred and stuff. And I know they exist, but I don't see them, which otherwise that would kill me. So how do you deal with – because being in the territory that we're in now, the yeah. mental health space, yeah. and I mean we're we're the two guys for the job. Like we, we we love what we do, but we have some really fucking hard conversations, mate. Like who do you have them to? Well, we get people coming in here. Like I mean, the, one of the most recent ones that really affected me was a fella who came in and he was a Kiwi fella, yeah. um, big friendly guy. And you know when Kiwis when they've just got that strong, thick, you know, that, you know Maori Kiwis. accent, they're and you just they, you just love them. Like, they're, they're infectious. Just, I, I love Kiwis. They're it's just infectious. great. They and kick the shit out of me in my 20s, but I love Kiwis. Yeah, well, that reminds me. I want to ask you what it's like facing the harker, but that's later. Yeah. So he's come in, and he's 
said, oh, he was, you know, looking at this shirt, that, that pattern, the FAF, and he's going, oh, bro, that, that's really sweet, you know, and wanted that one. And I was like, oh, yeah, man, no drama. And he started to tell me how, you know, that this mental health stuff, in his way of putting it, was yeah. really close to him. Yeah. And what I said, happened? I said, oh, yeah. I said, uh, I said, what, what? He goes, and then he starts stammering and getting out the fact that his son had taken his life oh, only only eight months yeah, earlier. Yeah, very recently, yeah. And he was a... He wow. Was, he was this guy's only son. <laughs> and and he was tearing up and obviously, for me, like, that's... You just let him go because you, all you've got to do is just listen, right? But the way he was talking and the way he was talking about it being his only son and seeing the look in his eyes, because I've seen that look in people's eyes before. I've seen that look in, in one of my best mate's mother's eyes, and it's not something you, you ever want to see. It's just complete loss. Lose a child's the worst thing. And I couldn't could never imagine it. And Ed was up upstairs, and he stuck his head out the, out the window, and I was, oh, mate, had his back to Ed, and I could see Ed, and I was sort of like, don't come down here sort don't of thing in, in my face, like... And so he went back and sat down and I had this massive long conversation. You know, we ended up hugging and I was like, mate, anytime you change numbers, anytime you want to come back, have a yarn, like this is, you nice, know, all mate. good. We'll always have a beer. Uh, I went back upstairs and I just broke down. I was like, I had mate, no idea what was going on. He's come upstairs in complete tears. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? I was and like, he told me and I was just like, we have my, those, my gut sunk. And yeah. I was like, oh my God. He just, like, we have those conversations a lot and it's, and it's always good. Like, cause you just, I don't know, we know how to do it, but that one in particular was really Touch fucking you. hard, yeah, yeah, because it's just for ta- your only son. And at that age, having finished school, you know, you think you're out and it's all good. But to my point was going to be that you must have a lot of conversations with all, all sorts of different types of people, the good email, and bad. The emails I get from people, so forget the criticism of me, that can't hurt me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, people write emails to you because I'm their friend. For yeah. some reason, I'm sitting next to them in the car. So, you know, they're driving, I'm just there. And, and I, I know they can go, fuck off, and push another radio. <laughs> <Yeah. show. laughs> it's, it's so easy. That's the reality. Yeah, if we yeah. piss them off, sometimes our ads yeah, piss them yeah, off, sometimes yeah. our songs piss them off, or yeah. sometimes me talking. But if they stay with you, um, yeah, and they'll send emails and they'll, they'll tell me stories and then I ring them and, oh, yeah, I, I don't want to go into it, but I, I'm very open and I've got time. Kath will, yeah, my wife yeah. will tell you I'll go out and have – People be dying of cancer, and and I mean that's <laughs> I'll awesome. Take mate. a six pack of beer, and that's part of my life. That's the unpaid part of my life, and that's I mean, why I appreciate what you guys are doing. But is anyone? I mean, no one's on the radio asking you about these kinds of things or talking to you about that. Like, do people know how much like those kinds of things that you actually do? Like you were talking earlier. No, about they don't. Taking, I don't. I don't want them to though. Yeah, but but it's, I want <laughs> I want to do my job, but then have them quietly uh, write me an email. I give out my number very freely. Um, get me on Messenger on Facebook and stuff like that. Can you give me a hand? And that's why I know what you do is so important. But I don't. It's not something you blurt about because it's not. Oh, how good am I? It's not. It's not that. I know what you what mean. You do. I yeah. know exactly what you mean. But yeah. I hopefully I sound there. friendly enough and open enough for them to approach me at times. So, um, yeah. But Shit, I, I, mate, I, on radio we've helped so many people. Like that's publicly, but there's so many behind the scenes the, who are hurting. Mate, hurt. well, the, th- the other thing is that um, well, even like elderly people as well are so lonely. Oh, God. You know, there's people that, and you see it all the time, you go to nursing homes and like every every year at Christmas, like I'm from Longreach and mum. Oh, shit, right, eh? Yeah, and mum's an, like always been a nurse and uh, every year we'll go up to the um, old people's home there at, at, um, at Longreach and we see old neighbours that we've had and like Ronnie Little and we always go up and see him and he's as deaf as a post and mum's talking right at his face and telling him what's going on, you know, Ronnie. And But then there's there's people up there that just never see anyone. They just you know, and they talk. talk and, and that's they, sad. That and is so is sad. So tragic. And yeah. you don't think about that now because you just think, oh, everything's rosy. But it's a, a, it's a real thing that your listeners would just be people that have got no one else but who they listen to you in the morning. Yeah. Like you're probably one of the only people that they hear from every day. And some of them shout at me, but some of them ring up, and it's, geez, it, it gets tough some days when you're talking about something. Uh, yeah, I, I can't even give us, as I say, we talk about too many things. They'll be talking about something, and then they'll just change the direction and go, My son died t- two months ago, things like that. And you go, Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Sorry, mate. And it completely, like, you could be talking about, I don't know, the new, you know, the. Oh, yeah, I don't know, for a new car or something or other. You'll be talking about something and they'll they'll say, yeah, that happened to me. And then they'll go, 
you know what my they do they want to talk to somebody yeah yeah, yeah sad that but that's shit that's the sad part of it but yeah. the thing is, is this is um that's that's just the oldies that we're talking about. But I oh think no, there's people in their twenties. Yeah, 30s well, but this and is 40s. the thing. It's, sorry, to my, yeah, but this is what these bloody shirts. What we're trying to do with these shirts, you know, make a bloody very loud way of starting conversations. Yeah. And yeah, it's about mental health. But mental health Are means they working, mate. Bloody oath, you, the story. <laughs> Yeah, you're here. That's right. I mustard. Well, mine's from Brett's Hardware. I said, "What's going on with those shirts? Why are you all? Why is the staff? Because I've had an account down there, at Brett's Hardware, yeah, yeah. for thirty years. Why are you wearing them? Oh, on Fridays we wear them. And what are they? I told them to turn around and show me. And wow, and that's how I discovered who, who you blokes well, are. Well, and that's what I said. You know, when we had a chat on the radio this morning about uh, blokes are funny creatures because yeah. it's hard to get them started, but once they start, oh. you can't shut them up. Which is good. Which is great. Yeah. It's fantastic, right? And that's what we need more of because the more practice you get in with doing that, well, then the easier it is to talk about some of that harder stuff. What are you hoping to do with this podcast? Well, that's exactly it because, like, we're trying to get, and we are, getting people out there every day talking about mental health, right? right? People saying, fuck, what's the go with that shirt, mate? It's and not just depression. No, you know what it's I mean? everything. It's like, any life events, anything that's going on, just, just, just to be talking. Like we were saying before, how people at Smoko now just sit on their phones. Oh, people aren't even, so we're trying to create that conversation again. And Dan and I were like, well, we can't be out and about all the time, us two, so why don't we get people in here and have conversations we want other people That's to be good. having. And I mean, uh, and just like we've done today, I mean, it's been unreal. I mean, the stuff we've spoken about, and like you've said, you've never spoken about this shit before. No, I don't. I probably have compartmentalised it, but it's... But That's good. That's not a bad thing. Like, Well, you can't keep... Yeah, you can't keep spurting everything out, I suppose. But I just feel that it's all on layers on layers, and it's made me who I am. It's given me enough exper- life experience well, to mate. be able to talk to people. I'm able to talk to people. I wasn't a talker when I was young. But this is the thing as well. I mean, I because I'm a firm believer as well. Look, I look at my own life, you know, and going through, you know, whatever, my childhood, growing up in Sydney, ending up in Brisbane, going through that carpentry apprenticeship, all these things to meet this guy, to losing one of my mates, to ending yeah. up being sitting in this freaking studio now with you talking about what we're talking about. Yeah. There's been some hard knocks, but shit it's, shit. If, if it wasn't for that stuff, I wouldn't be here. And luckily enough, you know, you know. How we, long are you two been best mates? Oh, since, since we met on a building site in four, oh, 2014. We hated each other for a good while. Did you? Still do. <laughs> well, bo- both carpenters, correct? Bo- well, he yeah. became my apprentice. Oh, so right, he, so he, So I was a couple of years out of my time. Yeah. I've been up in the Territory this, for a few years. This oh, good one. This Wally come down, you should... Like, the, I've never heard anything, anyone <laughs> sound like... What he sounded like. I just thought, holy shit, is this what they sound like out in the bush? A bloke from Longreach who then went to the ter- Where'd you work in the Territory? At Lake Nash. It's just uh, about 300 k's west of Mount Isa. It's right on the border. I got you. Out near... Uh, Camel Wheel. South Camel of Camel Wheel. Wheel. I yeah. remember buying a cassette there. Well, I went up and worked in Arnhem Land, <laughs> building oh, Aboriginal housing for three years. Oh, oh, for a hell. year, sorry. Yeah, right. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yes. Wasn't that... Living with four, three other men in a caravan building for the Aboriginals. Jeez, you was tough. Oh, the sweat and working up in that climate would be horrendous. And everyone sort of suss on you and you weren't allowed to drink and Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, you know, we've had a we've had a pretty good pretty good run at this point. But um I look we just we're really driven to make, you know, it's not the shirts are just what you see. But what we're really trying to do is just draw off this But they're the attention grabber. They are, they are the attention grabber, but to shake the shit out of this this mental health stuff and and lower the rates of male suicides, we need to change the culture. Yeah, all the way through. Don't hide so much stuff, or yeah, absolutely everything. Or you just guys done any psychology? We've, we've done. Been we've, through, we've done through a few courses. We've yeah, done right. the like mental health first aid. Oh, but right I mean, right. our our yeah. big thing is just talking to other psychologists and psychiatrists, basically, yeah. and just like I did pre marriage counselling. I've spoken about that a few times on this podcast. Like married I now, got married second of March. Right, so you and didn't have the pre marriage counselling. Go shit, this isn't. For this me. isn't. No. <laughs> well, the thing was, it wasn't. Um, it was my uh, now mother in law that said, you know, pre marriage counselling, you know. Is, is great because yeah. like we won't like me and my missus I don't think we've ever had like a full blow up dance or a bit of a Barney here last <laughs> on Saturday when we were painting the office upstairs yeah. but it's not something where no, you're that like that happens yeah but it was sort of like yeah no and Sally goes you know you guys should go do pre marriage counselling and I sort of thought oh yeah okay it's not a bad idea see in the old days you used to go and see a priest yeah well that's yeah well this is a Christian counselling type yeah, thing right. right so we went and did it and I was like this is awesome because any of those little niggling things that were creeping in and would create friction we quickly figured out what that That's was, great. You and to mate, talk. and it was unreal. 
It was so good. And then, um, yeah. Well, that, that's where it's at. you got to talk to your partner yeah. first up and then you can spread out to the world because women can teach you a lot of things. Your female partner teaches you so much about life. and that's My wife is a talker. Yeah. That's who's taught me how to talk. 100%. And the other uh, thing that I learned was, um, yeah, not trying to – because men are problem solvers yeah. and women are, like, thinkers. So, yeah. like, blokes are – like. Your missus will come home and she'll be telling you about you know something that's happened during the day and you're there trying to solve the problem. Well, she doesn't want the problem solved. She just no, wants she you wants to, to listen. Talking. <laughs> yeah, listening. to talk, talk and listen. Yeah, yeah. so it's it's interesting. This those oh. little finite things. But you got to sort it. You got to sort that out. Otherwise, you'll go through life with frustration. And geez, that's a big thing for men. Their frustration. Well, you hear all God, the time. That's what leads to male suicide. The yeah. frustration. Oh, I thought things were going to be better than that. I th- oh, why well, give up? And I, Jesus, how do you solve that? Well, yeah. I mean, we've talked about it. We had a mate of ours, Nick Sutherland, in here the other the other week. He's a mental health practitioner down yeah. on the Mornington Peninsula. He's ex-military, uh, medically discharged, PTSD, permanent leg injury, all this sort Jesus. of stuff. Yeah. But he's taught us quite a lot about, you know, it's perception and, you know, the way that you perceive success and what happiness kind of actually means. And, yeah. it's, and it's not actually driven by money and you know and it material be, and material objects but that's kind of where a lot of people are stuck and when they don't find themselves driving the, the v8 malu and you know have the you know all the all the, all the whiz bang you yeah know, everything that's just kind of a it'd be something you'd hear a lot mardo where blokes are like oh shit you got a good job mate you know you're just doing you know you're just doing works what you work do. yeah <laughs> works it's, work you're so lucky you mardo got. you know uh, whereas well, the, the footy thing i am mate because that's what i truly want to do the radio thing i do because it Pays all right. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, there'd be a lot of people that you'd, you know, I'm assuming that we'd be mates going, oh, you know, I just I hate my job, but I'd love to do something like that. I've always dreamt of doing something like that, but they never go and do it. You know, they hold back because of responsibility. Well, because they've either put themselves in a position, like Dan's just said, oh, this is what success looks like. And if I, and that's what I was um, talking about before when you leapt into radio, but I suppose that transition was different because you had your business anyway. So that was your support if yeah, something I fell had a through. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, as in people, yeah, probably worried of taking that step and, and heading well, in a makes you nervous. Sometime. Well, yeah. financial problems can make you nervous, but also erosion of um, erosion of men's not power, but gee, we're getting knocked around a bit. The white male gets knocked around a bit these days. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's it, yeah. and it's that's a, what it, it, creates it's frustration. Oh, I thought it, it was going to be better. You know, yeah, all it's this a, hard work I thought was going to lead to something more. Yeah, and people knock and people knock white men around. It's not a good time to be a white man. It's not, is it? And there's a lot of. Um, I mean, I see a lot. It'll of come again. Yeah, it, well, for sure. it'll, it'll leakwise, but certainly women are getting, uh, and and so they should too. There should be equalisation, but I think it's gone too far. I think this is talking to mates. Yeah, so. for yeah. sure. And so many people are caught up in this whole um, work, work, work. You know, to to bring home enough money to be able to give my family and my wife all these awesome things that they want, but they don't want those things. They want they you. Want you. Yeah. yeah, good and call. It's, and it's hard, to, it's hard to grasp that, I think, a lot of the time, especially when you're surrounded by people who are bringing home all those things and you think, well, shit, this, again, this is what success well, must you be. Previously, so. you'd just look at your neighbours, go, oh, you know, tw- Ted down the road, Steve over there's got that. But now, friggin' Instagram, what a horrible thing that is. And I'm so glad my son's not any of that shit. He, he's a carpenter. He goes to work and he's honest and he surfs and he paints and he thinks like that, makes surfboards. Daughter in Instagram, probably three and a half hours of her day is spent comparing his... Don't my greatest advice be don't compare. Yeah, you know, yeah. Don't compare yourself to anyone. Look after yourself first. Look after those close, and it all seems to take care of itself. That's great advice, mate, because that's something we talk about a lot. And look I, after you, yourself. Look after yeah. yourself, and don't don't compare yourself. I mean, it's it's okay to be to look at other people and be inspired by them and be motivated yes, by them. Good call. But but in terms of comparing yourself, or why isn't my life like that? Or why don't I have what they've got? Yeah. It's super counterproductive, mate. And God, that's got to be a big thing, mental health. Do you reckon big exercise time. is a big part of it? Huge. I was talking to my mate at work, and we were talking if you can get some, re- yeah, you know, just get the endorphins flowing and f- yeah. yeah. But, yeah. Find, but yeah. finding something on that, finding something that you like, yes. exercise doesn't have to mean going to the gym or and going for a run or anything. Like it doesn't that. have to mean that. There's yeah. plenty of other forms of exercise Shit, that are yeah. equally as good. You've got for to you. find what what's good for what you yeah. like. Yeah, like like your son surfing. Like so many surfers are the most chilled out dudes. Oh right? shit, aren't they? He's a skateboarder I wish I could and surfer surf. at the age of twenty. So <laughs> yeah. you know, and he's an apprentice carpenter. He's found his mojo. Yeah, but like you know, going and you know, Ed always talks about how his parents out in the bush. They used to have tennis parties, and and it 
more than about it wouldn't have been about the physical fitness. It's about getting together and just having a hit. You know, oh, and switching I mean? off, and that's that um, defining you know work and play. Mate, you know the loneliness of the country. Shit, those there's so, it's especially tennis now, court yeah. has brought so many country people in the old days, and it's, I hope they're still doing. Mate, it's it doesn't exist anymore. The it thing it did no, that's it it's, it's something that disappeared, and it's always been. Um, something I've always spoken about and my parents just always talk about how fondly it was yeah. you know like spoken fondly about it sorry about you know every Friday you'd be you know 100 k's down the road you'd be having a tennis party and yep. everyone would come with their like picnic baskets and you'd be getting on the tins and everyone, the blokes would be catching up and the wives would be catching up and the kids would be mucking around and it was just an awesome community sure way of getting was. people together and yep. like and even you know back in the day like there'd be a B&S on every weekend and people would travel but now it's sort of yeah vastly vastly different a lot and of dislocation yeah, I people mean, aren't but, yeah. talking enough, are they? Everywhere, urban and rural environments. Well, I mean, well, yeah, because one of the biggest things is everyone <laughs> seems to put up this facade to pretend that everything's okay. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, you're like, right. We talk, we spoke to another fellow, you know, who was on the podcast the other week, Warwick Bidwell, and he he's a business coach, which also kind of molds into a bit of life coaching as well. But he's yeah. like, well, I still sit, I still sit down to shit, mate. Like, you know, when you close that door at you know seven o'clock on a Thursday night, like. You know, everyone's having the same dramas behind that door in the house that everyone yeah, else does, right but eh? no one's talking. But if about we're collectively this. talking about it, we're going to get a resolution to help each other more. Obviously, like let's not keep suffering in silence. our silence with ourselves. Yeah. If we can bring it out and open up, because that's like Dan just said, if we're all going through it, well then that you know we don't use the word stigma, yeah. but I mean that's what it is, isn't it? If we're afraid of this thing it's just like let's just fucking cut the shit yeah no and, and i mean I we've just done that we've just life's had too short mate it is life's yeah too short it is mate i think we'll probably be getting close to wrapping up but i just before yeah, we had enough uh, of me oh mate no. well, I could, we could i could talk to you all <laughs> yeah. day it's just that i know how long this episode's gonna take me to upload can i to tell YouTube. you one <laughs> can i tell you one good radio story a funny one yeah, yeah this yeah. is about not this is how people get to trust you on radio okay Remember the Gold Coast Suns came into the competition? Have you ever heard me tell this story? No. no. In 2000. Oh shit, how long have they been around? Oh, I don't know, know maybe yeah, 10 years. They're fucking hopeless. So 2010, <laughs> whatever it was. 2010, they came in and they started to go, right, their first game was coming up. They probably, they'd lost every game. One, two, three, four, sixth week of the comp. They came to play the Gold Coast. Oh, uh, sorry, play the Brisbane Lions. Oh, I love the Brisbane Lions. Shit, how good were they this year? <laughs> anyway, so they come to play them and they started... Yabbering in the press, they you know, they have press conference. We're going to give it to the Lions, you know. Yeah, you know, we haven't shown a lot, but we were been improving. We're going to beat them. I got on the radio on the Friday morning, straight after the news. After I'd heard one more of their players saying this, I said, "What a load of crap!" I tell you what, I'll get the Gold Coast Suns logo tattooed on my ass if they beat the Lions this weekend. All right, so I have the weekend off. They were playing on Saturday night. Had the weekend off commentating rugby. So I said to Kath, right, no TV, let's have a game of Scrabble. We both love playing Scrabble. No TV, didn't watch rugby on the TV, didn't watch the Lions play the Suns. Played it and I could hear my phone. She said, no, no phone because we're having a romantic night at home. You know, kids are in bed. And um, could hear my phone ting and ting and went, no, forget it. Right, so I got up the next morning. It was Mother's Day. And... Uh, Went and did a load of washing, made Kath a cup of tea, took it into bed, made her some toast, you know, got the kids to take it in, la, la, la. And, um, and then I had Fox Sports News on while I'm hanging the washing out and I could hear it. In one of the greatest upsets the <laughs> AFL's ever seen, the Gold Coast Suns have defeated the Brisbane Lions last night at the Gabba. And I went, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I went inside. I went and, and then I went down to the servo, bought the Sunday Mail and went, Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> so I've now got a dilemma. So I go home for Mother's It's Mother's Day. Go over to Mum and Dad's place with Kath. And uh, I've, said, I've already had the chat with Kath. I said, I said it. I've <laughs> got to get a tattoo on my ass. I don't have a tattoo. I'm a clean skin. Um, I don't like tattoos. Um, and she went, what are you going to do? I said, I think I've got to do it. So I told them. And Dad said, they were laughing at lunch. My sisters and uh, my brother. They were laughing. I said, ha. Oh, House, get your ass ready, Greg. And that's what a lot of the text messages you've been reading from the night before. I've been swamped with people here, yeah, bend over and cop this, all that sort of shit. So, um, Dad had said, "Well, mate, I uh, I don't think I can talk to you if you get a tattoo ever again." I went, "What? I said, it's only a tattoo. It's on my ass. No one will see it." He went, "No, I'm sorry." Mum said, "Yeah, that's horrendous, Greg. You can't be none of our family's tattooed." Gregory, you'll be the, yeah, that is that was it. <laughs> you'll be the first of our family to be tattooed. You're the black sheep. You know, we used to be proud of you. We're not now. If you get a tattoo, so I've left the family lunch that day. 
I said to Kath, I'm, nah, if I don't get a tattoo, no one's ever going to believe anything else I say on radio. So fair enough, I front up and um, we found a tattoo artist um, on the Sunday afternoon, got a producer to find a tattoo artist. And unfortunately, it must have been a slow morning. All three TV networks, 7, 10 and um, 9, came into the studio that morning. While my ass, my, it's pretty hairy too, while my ass was getting tattooed. Now, if you don't know, give us a hold of this. I didn't know the reason I went and bought the goal at the uh, Sunday Mail was to find out what the score was, but also I wanted to find out what their fucking logo was. <laughs> it's a G and a C with sun coming out of it like that, okay? <laughs> My name's Greg. My wife's name's Kath. There was a silver lining that uh, <laughs> I was able to say to you. Know, so it actually looked like there's a sun and it's all red and orange. So that's what's on my ass, like a f- <laughs> that size. You're kidding me. All right, so I got the tattoo and Kath said, you're a disgrace, didn't tell the kids. That night I'm cooking dinner and I always have the news on because it's handy for radio. My poor children who are that stage of 10 and 11, they've just gone, Dad! Dad, your ass is on TV. <laughs> there it is, third story of the night. Me, the, 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 the tattoo artist. And I'm going, what, have you, is that real, Dad? I said, yes, children, that is real. And just pulled the pants down and there it is. What a disgrace. When was that? In about two, whenever the sun started. 2008, 2009. Whatever year the sun yeah, started. 2009, I think. Yeah, the kids would have been eight or that nine or something. unbelievable. All right, and that's why you can't talk bullshit on radio. radio. If you're going to try, don't, you actually don't talk bullshit on radio. That buys you. I can tell any, I can say anything I want for years after that and people go, Fuck, he might get another tat. <laughs> <laughs> no, no more. Marto, the price um, you pay, the price you pay for credibility. Yeah, yeah that's exactly <laughs> right, mate. Just to, to finish it up, uh, we've got an event coming up on the on the thirtieth of November. Uh, it's a bit of a, a launch party for our non for profit foundation. This is a conversation starter. Yeah, and uh, you're you're going to be there. At X Cargo, you have told me about it. But is that true? I guess I am. The World Cup's <laughs> over, so I'm available. Mate, Jay Ball reckons you'll be down there and helping us fly the flag. Oh, It'll be fantastic. So um, there's a few other people, Budgie Smuggler and uh, YP Threads. It's going to be a good afternoon. Might, might be an event all to all to raise money to be able to remove the physical and financial barriers for anyone being able good to way. access professional mental health treatment. Right up. Well, can I get you two, one of you two, to come on radio before that event to drum up a bit of support as well? Mate, 100%. It's a deal. It'll be epic. Can we get the tattoos in there? (laughs) We're not getting any tattoos. <laughs> I'll show you it if you behave yourself. Oh, you God. Have a look at my ass. Thanks yeah. again for your time, Marto, mate. Oh, it was an awesome chat, and I, I'm, I'm sure I know our listeners are going to get a hell of a lot out of it. And um, yeah, we'll uh, we'll hopefully catch up again. I think you've helped me. Thank you, mate. Hey, that's, oh, that's good awesome. to hear. Well, we yeah. like to create a bit of a safe space where you know, yeah. so you just talk talk whatever you want. There's no judgment in here. Oh, so nice one. Good on you, Greg. Cheers. Thanks, Marto. You're a champion. Thanks, Thanks for coming you. in. Thanks, mate. Lovely boys.